All esteem to the Most High Elohim, all praise to the Ancient of Days. This is your brother L. As you all know, uh, for many years, I have a collection of discussions that I did on Spreaker that are a lot of the older discussions. And we brought one of those out a couple days ago, which was a discussion that was done many, many years ago called The War Against the Israelite Alpha Male. And um, brothers and sisters received that uh, discussion on good ground. I felt like it was very fruitful. So I wanted to dig back in the archives to bring forth another uh, very old discussion that was done uh, many, many years ago. But the information and the scriptures touched on in this discussion that I'm about to show right here are still right on target for what brothers and sisters deal with today. And it actually kind of connects with the topic that we had for the live stream uh, last Shabbat about uh, relationships with the black man and black woman. But this discussion goes deeper than just uh, romantic relationships between a man and a woman. It just talks about relationships in the last days period and how in these last and wicked times, many people have become betrayers. Uh, many people have become murderous. And in, in this scripture, I just I talk about how we circumnavigate in these times, how we move with discernment and be wise as a serpent in these times and how we always need to be cautious and guard our heart as it pertains to dealing with relationships in the last days. That's the name of the discussion. Uh, it's another one of those discussions from the Spreaker Archive that we did many, many years ago, but the information touched on here still is pertinent for today. So I want y'all to enjoy this discussion that was done a while ago called Relationships in the Last Days. Shalom. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. I'm going to be very short tonight because I got things to do tomorrow. Very busy. But I want to make sure I came in here and touched on these precepts. But we're going to be quick about this. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. Here's what it says. It says, know this also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Listen to how it explains people's nature and attitudes would be. It says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of the Most High, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And the last words it tells us here is, in verse 5, from such people turn away. So it right there gives us a laundry list of the type of nature that people would have in these last days. And all these things that are mentioned here are traits of dysfunctional people who will cause dysfunctional relationships. So the reason you and I see so much strange, dysfunctional behavior and so many strange spirits in operation and just weird um, traits of people in these last days is because these are the characteristics that they walk after. These are their attributes. Everything written here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. And it says it's prophesied that it would be like this in these last days. It said, know this also, that in the last days, and nobody would argue that we're in the last days. So this is talking about the time we're living in now. Know this also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. That means people are going to have a dysfunctional spirit, and they're going to have dysfunctional relationships because they're, they're going to be selfish and narcissistic. They're only going to be focused on themselves. So they're not worried about whose feelings they hurt, uh, who they step over, how many people they cut off, and how many dead-end relationships they have. They're driven by a, a love of their self, a narcissism, and a selfishness. The scripture says in the last time it would be like that. So that's one reason for all these dysfunctional people and dysfunctional relationships out here. It says also, they shall be covetous, meaning people will always want something that somebody else has. They will have low self-esteem and can't be satisfied with the skin they're in and the life that the Most High gave them, the family that the Most High gave them. 
the talent that the Most High gave them. They won't be satisfied with none of this because they want somebody else's bloodline, somebody else's heritage, somebody else's family, somebody else's looks, mentality, characteristic, whatever it is, they covet after that. And we know that Torah tells us thou shalt not covet. But these people in these last days, they have dysfunctional relationships because they are very covetous. Somebody could covet the relationship that you have with your family. Somebody could covet and hate you just because you have a strong family in your background and they don't have that. So that covetous that they have will inspire them by demon spirits to try to bring dysfunctionality to your life. And that's what these people try to do. They want to bring dysfunctionality to you and a lack of peace. Because that lack of peace and dysfunctionality is how slowly but surely they will drag your spirit down. This is what the enemy wants to do through them. And this was prophesied about how relationships would be in the last days. Here also it said people will be boasters, meaning they will be proud. They will, you know, always try to put themselves above the next man or woman always boasting about their possessions, their position. You know, they, they may not even have any possessions or position that is worthy of them boasting about, but they would just have a spirit of pride. Ain't done nothing ever in life to be proud of, but they just have that proud spirit about them. So that pride that they bring into their relationships causes dysfunctionality. That's another reason for all these dysfunctional relationships in the last time. People are proud. They think they know it all when they don't know nothing. They think they somebody when they're nobody, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, meaning that no matter what you do for these people, they tend not to remember the positive things you did for them, but they only remember it when you didn't do something for them that they want. So the reason for a lot of these dysfunctional relationships in the last time is people have entitlement mentalities. For some reason, they think they're just entitled for you to bow down to them or to constantly be at their beck and call. Some people get worked up and they can't handle it when other human beings don't fit the mold of behavior that they want them to fit when they want them to fit it. For some reason, people have an entitlement, unthankful mentality where they feel like everybody else is supposed to be their servant. When little do they know that they're not even worthy to be a servant themselves. Only by the grace of the Most High are we allowed to be His servants. But they have a mentality where they think everybody should serve them. That's that privilege. And we see that even amongst this society as we live amongst our oppressors. You've heard the term before, you know, some people have white privilege where the Europeans feel like they're a cut above everybody else. And many of them still benefit from the system of oppression that has happened against the children of Israel and the lesser minorities. Some of our people, people of color, have an entitlement mentality. Some of us get hooked on a lot of these systems of government and giving away these benefits and free checks so much to the point where some people don't even have a drive to go out and work for themselves because they feel like it should be given to them by somebody else. So people become unthankful because they're so used to somebody giving them something else. So when they get in a relationship where they feel like they're not getting what they want when they want it, that unthankful spirit comes out and it causes dysfunction. It said also people will be unholy without natural affection. That means people would be cold hearted, you know, desensitized. They would treat people abusive and treat people like crap and not even feel bad about it where they can break people's heart use people trample on people's soul and emotions and walk away not even feeling like they did anything they may say i'm sorry but they don't mean it in their heart they are without natural affection meaning they almost get joy in making others suffer whether it's emotional suffering financial suffering isolating people denying people companionship they want to starve and thirst you out of companionship. They don't want to give you the companionship that, you know, natural human beings should give each other in fellowship, but they want to deny you companionship and isolate you to try to starve and thirst you out. It's almost like a military tactic. These people lack natural affection. They don't have the ability to empathize. 
They don't have the ability of compassion. They know they have no compassion for the victims that they create. All they do is go on rampages of hurting and destroying people in all their relationships because they're dysfunctional. They have a broken, dysfunctional spirit and they are without natural affection. Truce breakers, meaning people in these last days would have a lot of dysfunctional relationships because they don't know how to keep promises. False accusers, incontinent, meaning people would be inconsistent. You know, bipolar, one day they love you, next day they hate you, next day they love you. One day they want to cut you off and you be out of their life. Four months later, they calling you back, talking about they want you back. Then a month later, they cutting you off again. So these people would be inconsistent. So some people have that dysfunctional spirit because they inconsistent. It says they would be fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of the most high. And the scripture tells us here in Second Timothy chapter three, verse five, from such people turn away. So we don't even need to be unequally yoked with these people because these people carry a dysfunctional spirit with them. Everything they touch goes into dysfunction. Every relationship that they're in goes into dysfunction. Every job that they are on, they cause dysfunction. These are the state of relationships in the last days. And the Most High warned us about this. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24, verses 10 and 12. And let's see what the Messiah had to say about why would there be so many dysfunctional relationships in the last time. In Matthew 24, 10, he says, In the last days many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. So in these last days, people are easily offended because people are so sensitive. People are offended by the truth in these last days. So it causes dysfunction whenever you're a person who tells the truth. Whenever you're a truth teller, your words and your actions are going to rub people the wrong way. They may not let you know outwardly, but they may hold that offense deep within their heart and the demons within them may not manifest till two, three years down the road. They're, that spirit that's festering in them is just waiting for an opportunity to pounce on you. These are the type of spirits that's in people now. People are easily offended. They're quick to break fellowships with people over petty nonsense. Why? Because they're offended. They get easily offended. So that offense builds up and festers in their heart like a cancer. And what they do is they plot ways to betray you, just like Judas did to Yeshua. The offense that Judas had in his heart, you see, people think that Judas just one day up and decided to betray the Messiah. No, but when you really read the scriptures, you'll see that that offense and betrayal was festering in his heart the whole time because there were issues that weren't dealt with. And that's one thing that causes dysfunctional relationships, y'all, is people let things fester in their heart. Instead of approaching a person and dealing with something right off the bat when it happens, like, yo, what you just said to me really offended me. How you just treated me was really offensive to me. I don't like what you just did. I don't like what you just said. Instead of doing like the Messiah tells us to do and going to a brother or sister and bringing our issues to them out, what people tend to do in these last days is let stuff fester. So they don't want to bring a resolution to any conflict. What they'd rather do is wait until an opportune time to get revenge on you. So people in these last days, a lot of relationships are dysfunctional because people don't want redemption. They don't want restoration. They want revenge. That's what people want. They want you to hurt and suffer the way they've hurt and suffered. Instead of approaching you and having restoration and redemption to bring healing, they just want to inflict pain on you seven times worse than they felt. You see? So people are carrying that offense and betrayal in their heart and it's causing dysfunctional relationships because nobody is open and honest and sincere with anybody anymore. People always have Machiavellian strategies and agendas on how to betray the people that they feel have done them wrong instead of trying to talk something out and come to a healing solution. People have offense and betrayal in their heart. We're talking about relationships in the last days. Let's go to verse 12 of Matthew 24 and it says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. We're seeing that right now. People's love is waxing cold. 
people are getting more and more cold hearted. And let me tell you why. Because at one point in time, these people once had hope. They had hope in the better um, leaning or better intent of people that they dealt with. But somewhere along the line, their trust in people got betrayed. It got scarred. They may have gotten used. You know, they may have gotten something taken from them by somebody they that was close to them. They may have had uh, a relationship that lasted for years and then suddenly something happened, some sort of emotional trauma happened and it got destroyed. They may have had somebody that they really looked up to in their life that all of a sudden went out the picture, whether it was that person um, dying by natural causes or getting killed, suicide, or just leaving the family, whatever it was, somebody that they invested a lot, of, a lot of love and trust in abandoned them. So it causes people to have an abandonment complex. So they curl up into this defenseless ball from the world. And anybody that tries to get close, they basically uh, pounce on that person to try to hurt whoever is trying to come in their life to help them. They want to bring hurt to that person because one, something inside of them doesn't want them to get abandoned again. But then another spirit of self self sabotage is working in their life to where they intentionally push people away because they've been in pain and isolation for so long that that's now normal to them. So anything that is, you know, functional, healthy, loving, respectful, that brings a balance in their life, they shun it and fight against it, even though that's what they really want because they become so used to pain, isolation, rejection, and abandonment that that's their normal. You know, abnormality has become their norm. So anything that's truly normal and truly functional, they'll fight it and push it away because they feel like it's di disrupting their truth. Even though the truth they think is the truth is a lie. Like the Messiah said that if your, if your eye is darkened, even the little bit, even the darkness that you have in your eye, hold up. He said, even the light that you have in your eye is darkness because you're blinded. You're blinded to the dysfunctionality in your own mind. And the problem is since there's so many generational curses at work, a lot of people don't know good when they see it. A lot of people don't know healthy relationships when they see it because they're so used to seeing dysfunctionality. So it makes them attract towards dysfunctionality. But little do they know they're bringing even more of a curse on themselves by inflicting pain on all these other people who try to come in their life to help. So whenever we see this mentality in a person that their love is becoming cold, sometimes with these individuals, you really have to have on the armor of the most high when dealing with them. You have to deal with them through those rubber gloves that the scientists who deal with very contagious, um, level four serious diseases deal with. I mean, you have to put on the triple rubber gloves with these people because a spirit of self-sabotage works through them and a spirit of pouncing on people who mean well operates through them. So you have to, you have to deal wisely with these people. All right. Relationships in the last days. Now let's go to second Ezra chapter 15, verse 16 through 19. And let's also learn why this attitude is prevalent in society today and how eventually it's going to erupt into a mass uprising. Because you see, a lot of the things that we're talking about in scripture, it's a mentality that stretches over the entire world. The scriptures are saying that the entire world, all humanity is going to begin to have this type of mindset, this unrest, this cold heartedness, this hatred, this dysfunctionality. A lot of people are going to be operating after this. You know, some people have theories that the reason people are going to be uh, having these attitudes is the chemicals that they're putting in the water. You know, um, a lot of the entertainment that's pumped to people, a lot of the technology, you know, the microchip that's going to be put in people, it's going to make them act out like this. But, you know, we know from scripture that this inherent wickedness and just twisted nature has always been in humans since our fall. 
So a lot of these other things like the microchip and technology and GMO and the food and all these chemicals they're, you know, pumping us up with, all that's going to do is just enhance the wicked nature we already have. But eventually this wicked, dormant, boiling, fiery nature that's already in people, it's going to explode into international anarchy and chaos. And 2 Ezra chapter 15, 16 through 19 explains this. And we got to understand that that this hatred is boiling inside people's hearts. Even though you go out in society and people are smiling and, you know, at the grocery store and out with the kids and all that, that's just a facade. Whenever chaos erupts into society, you're going to see a lot of these smiley face, flower dress wearing soccer moms become cannibals. You're going to see a lot of these people who seem so functional and, you know, well-mannered and soft-spoken in society turn into murderous mobs. That's what this change is going to do to people because that that hidden hatred is already in them and a lot of them have not searched their heart to seek out that subconscious treachery that's within them you see so like the scripture says what is hidden shall be made manifest so if there's any leaven inside our heart it will manifest whenever the right amount of light is shined on it so whatever that is in us will manifest so we constantly need to be purifying ourselves so that we don't end up being these people who become sons of chaos and sons of anarchy and murderous people in these last days. Because it says in 2nd Ezra chapter 15, verse 16, For there shall be unrest among people, one party growing strong against another, and they shall in their might have no respect for their king or the chief of their leaders. So people are basically going to start saying, you know, F the authorities. F all these leaders, let's revolt. Let's start killing uh, uh, mercilessly. That's the mentality that's going to rise in these people. They're going to turn into rebels, murderous rebels. It says, for a person will desire to go into a city and shall not be able to do so. Because of their pride, the cities shall be in confusion. The houses shall be destroyed and people shall be afraid. People shall have no pity for their neighbors. Let me read this again. This is the nature that's going to happen. This is the reason for so many dysfunctional relationships. Because people, verse 19, people shall have no pity for their neighbors, but shall make an assault upon their houses with the sword and plunder their goods because of hunger for bread and because of great tribulation. So people are going to turn into murderous zombies. That's what's going to take place. That dis dysfunctional spirit that's already dormant in so many people is going to rise to the surface. And they're going to be breaking into their neighbor's house. Yeah, that same smiley face neighbor that you went and played bingo and spades with. And, you know, went to their they daughter's baby shower and y'all went to the, uh, to the swimming pool together. Those are going to be the same ones trying to break in your house to kill you and steal your food. You see why? Because that dysfunctional nature is already within people. And this is what we're going to talk about in part two. How do we discern if a person has that dysfunctional spirit in them so we can avoid them? But we'll talk about that in part two. Right now, we're just dealing with part one. Second Esther chapter six, verse 24. Remember, we're talking about relationships in the last days and why we see so many, so much strange behavior and dysfunctionality. And we have to go through this, brothers and sisters, because y'all need to know this so that whenever you're confronted and you interact with people who have these dysfunctional spirits, it's not going to throw you for a loop. Or if somebody shows you their true colors and manifest that spirit on you and they try to turn on you or flip on you or betray you, it's not going to shake your faith because your mind will automatically go back to these scriptures we're reading here and you'll understand why there's so many dysfunctional people and dysfunctional relationships. It won't phase you whenever somebody calls themselves walking out of your life or cutting you off or, you know, a person who you thought was close to you. Maybe you knew them for 15, 20 years and suddenly they turn on you and strike you and, you know, assault you like a viper and sink their poisonous teeth into you. Instead, instead of you falling out and dying and, you know, giving up the faith and turning your back on the Messiah, like so many people will do, you'll just shake off the vipers like Paul did in Acts 28, because you will already know why these people have these dysfunctional spirits. 
And when we go through part two and three, you'll know how to deal with them. So whenever you're confronted with these satanic, demonic characters, you'll know what you're facing and it won't throw you off. So you'll have a strong foundation. You see, that's why we're going through these precepts and talking about relationships in the last days. So whenever you're encountered with these demonic personalities, it won't throw you off, but you'll be able to handle them. So second Ezra chapter six, verse 24, it tells us that in these last days, what does it tell us about relationships in the last days? It says at that time, friends shall make war on friends like enemies. So the scripture here is saying that in these last days, brothers and sisters, it's going to be hard to find a true friend because people that were once the best of friends will make war on each other. So don't be shocked if somebody who has been your best friend for 20, 30 years turns on you when they see the spirit of the most high operating in your life. Because second Esther chapter six, verse 24 prophesies that in the last days, relationships would be so dysfunctional that friends would even make war on their own friends as if they were enemies. All right. So don't be shocked when some of your closest friends turn on you. That's a part of this game, brothers and sisters. That's the nature of relationships in these last days. Relationships in the last days are totally different than how they've been throughout all the history of humankind. Because there's going to be some very, very, very powerful demonic spirits released from the pit who are going to indwell in these people. And it's going to change them, you know, and it's going to make friends declare war on friends like enemies. So just get ready for that. All right. Trust the Most High only. Trust the Holy Spirit only. Trust the Messiah only. All right. Let's go to Mark chapter 13, verse 12, because the Messiah says the exact same thing that we just got done reading in 2nd Ezra chapter 6, verse 24. He says, now the brother shall betray the brother to death and the father, the son and children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. So here we see that even close family, people that's of your same blood, even other Israelites will turn on you. All right. So don't get caught up in this just because somebody say they Israel or, you know, their bloodline Israel, you know, don't get caught up in that because Israelites are going to be turning on other Israelites in these last days because there's going to be many dysfunctional relationships in the last times. Luke chapter 12, verse 53, it says the father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Matthew chapter 10 verse 36 and it says, And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Let me read that again. We're talking about relationships in the last days. What does it say about relationships in the last days? It says, And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. I think that's pretty straightforward. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26 through 27, because the things that Paul describes that he went through are things that we're going to be going through in these last days. Listen to what this brother said that he went through, because when Jacob's trouble hits, these are the things that we're going to be dealing with. You see, Paul, this brother dealt with isolation, imprisonment, oppression, uh, getting denied by people who once looked him in his eyes and said they loved him, being betrayed by false brethren, getting, uh, you know, beat down by police and authorities and politicians of his day. All these things that this brother went through, we're going to have to go through. All right. He says, I was in journeys often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. All these things that Paul said he went through and had to endure are exactly what we're going to have to endure, brothers and sisters. We're going to have to be in journeys often. Because the scripture says in 2nd Ezra, in that day, we must be like strangers in the earth. So don't be shocked whenever you see a lot of people come in and out of your life. Because the Most High will have you operating like a stranger in the earth. Meaning there will be a time where you have to be on the move. So don't be getting attached to people. Get attached 
to the kingdom. Make sure that your heart and mind is attached only on making it to the kingdom. Because if you start getting attached to people and distracted by them, then whenever that person you was attracted to leaves your life, which so many people will often do, people come and go. It's a revolving door in some of our lives. So when they go, because you're not attached to them, you're attached to the kingdom, you won't be devastated when they leave. Because in these last days, relationships are going to be so dysfunctional that people are going to come and go in your life. Very few people will stay. It's going to be a revolving door, especially when you're doing the work of the Most High. So get attached to the kingdom, not the people. You see what I'm saying? Because Paul said he was in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, meaning he had people around him who stole from him. You're going to have people around you who only want to take your stuff. He said, in perils by my own countrymen, meaning people that look like him, his same skin tone, his same bloodline. These people turned on him. He said, in perils by the heathen. So not only was he getting betrayed and done in by his own people of his same color and bloodline, but also by the Gentiles. So in these last days, we're going to have our own people and the Gentiles coming at our head. That's how dysfunctional that the relationships are going to get in the last days. So don't get hung up on Hebrew and Gentile. Test people's spirit because the enemy is going to use both Hebrews and Gentiles to try to keep you from enduring until the end. He said in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness. So, so no matter where we're going to be at, whether the wilderness or the city, we still are going to have to come face to face and confront these dysfunctional personality types. It's no escaping them, brothers and sisters. There's no escaping these people. Even if you were to be a hermit, living 40 years by yourself in the desert, you would still have to look dead in your own face and see the dysfunctional personality within your own self and learn how to conquer that. So there's no running from this. So we're going to have to learn how to be warriors and soldiers and confront these dysfunctional relationships and these dysfunctional personality types and overcome them, just like Paul did. He said, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, meaning the fake and phony people around him that meant him no good but smiled in his face, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, meaning sometimes the brother didn't get no sleep at night, in hunger and thirst, meaning sometimes the brother didn't eat or drink, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, meaning sometimes the brother didn't even have clothes on his back. And this is going to be the life that many of us live in the days of Jake, Jacob's trouble. So the only thing that we're going to be able to cling to is the Most High Himself. So don't get devastated if you end up in a position where you're cold and naked. Don't get devastated if you end up in a position where, you know, you stuck in a prison somewhere and they about to cut your head off and behead you for the truth of the Most High. Don't get devastated if you're in a position where you haven't ate nothing for seven days or drank anything in three days because you've been on the run trying not to get caught from somebody trying to beat you down just because of who you are as a child, a child of Israel. These are the things that are going to be happening to us. So prepare your mind and your spirit and your body for this already because ain't nobody getting around this. You see? So we're going to have to learn how to face these dysfunctional relationships and situations and overcome them. Second Ezra chapter 16, verse 40 through 45, it says, Hear my words, O my people, prepare for battle, and in the midst of the calamities be like strangers on the earth. Let the one who sells be like the one who will flee. Let the one who buys be like the one who will lose. Let the one who does business be like the one who will not make a profit. And let the one who builds a house be like one who will not live in it. Let the one who sows be like one who will not reap. So also the one who prunes the vines like one who will not gather the grapes. Those who marry like those who will have no children. And those who do not marry like those who are widowed. So that brother just gave a whole list of how we're supposed to uh, behave in these last days. And the mindset we're supposed to have. Essentially he's saying don't get attached to anything. Even if it's your wife or husband. Don't get attached to it. Don't get attached to your job. Don't get attached to your cars. Don't get attached to your house. Don't get attached to your bank account. Don't get attached to the clothes on your back. Because he says here in 2nd Esther chapter 16, 40 through 45, that when these things that will happen take place, that we must be like strangers in the earth. You see? 
We must be like people who have a mindset of doing what they have to do to get to that kingdom, of staying on the move to survive and to endure. That's the mentality that we'll need to have. So that way, all these dysfunctional people and dysfunctional relationships and distractions, they will not drag your spirit down because your mind will be on the kingdom and the kingdom alone. The, your naked soul will be so attached to the thought of making it to the kingdom that none of these other things, pain, weariness, lack of sleep, disloyal friends, people betraying you, family betraying you, Gentiles trying to kill you, Israelites trying to betray you, none of these things will bring you down because you're so focused on the kingdom. But a lot of people are going to have focuses on a lot of these external things. As the Messiah warns here in Matthew 24, 37 through 38, he says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. Now this particular verse causes a lot of controversy because we know that the Messiah is not saying here that there's something wrong with eating and drinking or getting married. There's nothing evil about those things. He gave us food and drink to be merry in the earth. He ordained marriage as a righteous institution for us to be married. He even said it's not good for a man to be alone. So eating and drinking is beautiful and marrying and having marriage is beautiful. So what was he trying to say here in Matthew 24, 37 through 38, when he said that in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. What he was saying here, brothers and sisters, is that that was people's main focus. Their main focus was not on pleasing the Most High, keeping the commands, making it to the kingdom. Their focus was on, I got to get me a husband. I got to get me a man. You know, I got to, uh, you know, go to Chipotle and get me a, a, a burrito with extra guacamole and sour cream. I got to go down to Red Lobster and, you know, give me some cheese biscuits and you know, their mind was on being a lover of pleasure. They were into the pleasure of the immediate moment. So they were eating and drinking, meaning they were feasting, partying, caught up in selfish, vain entertainment. They were marrying and giving in marriage, meaning that just like today, you see a lot of people who they're more focused on having a spouse than getting in the kingdom. I hear, you know, men and women alike spending more time talking about, you know, how to have the perfect relationship or how to get the perfect woman or the perfect man. You know, they spend hours and hours looking at these talk shows, reading these teeny, teeny bopper, girly uh, vanity magazines and YouTube videos and TV shows and all that. And it has their mind on nothing but the flesh. You know, listening to these Steve Harvey radio shows all the time, talking about, you know, think like a man, act like a woman and all this other nonsense that people's minds are wrapped up in. You know what that is? They are eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. That's their focus. Some people can give you the techniques and tips and strategies of how to trap a man or a woman into marrying you or having a baby with you more than they can give you the tips and techniques of how to make it to the kingdom. They can't tell you the secrets of the kingdom and the secrets of wisdom, but they can tell you how to get you a baller for a husband. They can tell you how to be the perfect baby mama. They can tell you, you know, the, the best fashion tips and, you know, and makeup, makeup tutorials and how to have glamorous skin and, you know, how to have the perfect hair and, you know, what shampoo and conditioner works the best to give your hair that bounce and that gleam. You know, uh, where, where to go to get your nails done the best, how to get waves in your hair, you know, all this other fleshly mess and madness that ain't going to mean nothing for your eternal treasure in the kingdom. That's what the Messiah was talking about, that in these last days, relationships would be dysfunctional because people would be focused on all this other mess. Sitting around chit-chatting and having all this girl talk and, you know, talking about, you know, who who performs the best sexually and, you know, tips on great sex and all this other stuff that people are wrapped up in instead of being focused on making it to the kingdom. You see? But the, the judgment that's going to come on these people because they have that attitude is that a lot of the things they hoped in will be taken away. So a lot of these people who 
they were looking for marriage or the perfect spouse more than they were looking to make it to the kingdom, what's going to be the judgment on them? Well, 2nd Ezra chapter 16, verse 33 through 34 tells us, it says, virgins shall mourn because they have no bridegrooms. Women shall mourn because they have no husbands. Their daughters shall mourn because they have no help. Their bridegrooms shall be killed in war and their husbands shall perish of famine. So the Most High is saying, okay, since all you focused on is getting you a man or getting you a woman or having you the perfect relationship, because your mind is not focused on making it to the kingdom, I'm going to cause you to be husbandless. I'm going to cause you to go without a wife. I'm going to cause you to be in a position where all you can depend on is me. Because it says here in the last, in uh, 2nd Ezra 16, 33 through 34, that it would be so many dysfunctional relationships in the last days. It says that women shall mourn because they have no husbands. Meaning that there's going to be a large amount of single mothers in these last days. That single motherhood is a curse, brothers and sisters. And I'm not trying to diss no single mothers or single fathers, but that's not what the Most High intended. But the reason that's taking place is the selfishness of a lot of individuals is being judged. Now, I'm not saying that if somebody is a single father or a single mother that they're being judged or cursed. I'm saying on a general standpoint that the reason that there's so much dysfunctionality is because a lot of people have those traits that we read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. A lot of people have those selfish, proud, narcissistic, ungrateful, unthankful type of mentalities. And you know, that with that spirit of feminism also that's going on in the earth, the Most High is going to judge a lot of these women by them being in a position where they will have no husbands. And here in 2nd Ezra 16, 33, it says the women shall mourn because they have no husbands. Their daughters shall mourn because they have no help. Their bridegrooms shall be killed in war and their husbands shall perish of famine. You know, so we don't need to be focusing on having the perfect spouse or the perfect family and all that. We need to be focused on being that perfect bride for the most high to make it to the kingdom. Now, I'm not saying should somebody not have a goal to get married or raise a family. I'm not saying somebody shouldn't have that goal. It's a beautiful thing. All I'm saying is when you put that above the kingdom, inadvertently what you're setting yourself up for is a disappointment and a curse to come on your life because you're putting that above the kingdom. So the Most High will probably put you in a position where you're not going to have none of that that you was putting above Him. If you wanted a husband more than Him, then he's probably not going to give you a husband so that you'll understand how real this is, that your mind is supposed to be on the kingdom and the kingdom alone. If your mind is just on having a wife with a big behind and some big breasts that are do anything you tell her and you putting that above the kingdom, then the most high will take that from you. You see, just so you understand that it's kingdom first. Now, if you have a great spouse, a great wife, a great husband, and you keep your marriage in the position that it's supposed to be, which is second to your mind being on the kingdom, then the Most High will bless you and your marriage because you're keeping everything in proper order. But unfortunately, the scripture here prophesies that on a majority scale, that a lot of these women will mourn because they have no husbands. So on a grand scale, the majority of people are going to be in dysfunctional relationships, failed marriages, divorces, abusive relationships, their curse is going to be that they have dysfunctionality because they never had a functional relationship with the Most High. You see? Listen to what else the Messiah says here in Matthew 24, 19. He says, And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. So, you know, a lot of these women and men who put, you know, having kids above making it to the kingdom, you know, and there's people out there like that. You know, when I have a son, I'm going to name him Jaquan. If I have a girl, I'm going to name her Marissa. And, you know, look at these cute baby outfits and all that. Spend, if they spend more time looking over names for a baby and, you know, looking at, at uh, rooms in magazines or how they're going to paint the room when they have their baby, if they focusing on that and, you know, uh, gathering around each other at the at the table at lunch talking about yeah you know I just found out that I'm pregnant you know the baby's due next March 
You know, if they sitting around spending more of their time talking about that instead of making it to the kingdom, the Messiah says here, woe unto you that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. So he's saying, woe unto you women who put having a baby, you know, above making it to the kingdom. Because think about this. Whenever we're out there in the wilderness, you know, running from the authorities trying to behead us and kill us. How hard is that going to be for a woman holding a baby and fleeing at the same time? How hard would it be for a woman that's eight months pregnant to be able to run from a group of soldiers trying to capture her and put her in a concentration camp? So the Messiah is saying, woe unto them that are with child. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't, you know, have a goal to have children, raise families. But look, the Messiah said that, not me. So he's saying, woe unto them that are with child and that give suck in those days. So think about that. Think about the times that we're living in. Think about that. Just let that rest on you here for a moment. Because for you brothers out there that's single, I'm going to talk to you first because me being a single brother myself, you know, this is a good message to y'all. And we're going to deal with everybody else because I'm going to keep it equal and balanced. We're going to deal with people who are married, people with children and all that. But, you know, I can only speak from being a single man at this point. But we still going to deal with other scriptures of what the Most High has to say to married people too. But listen to what the Most High told Jeremiah here in Jeremiah 16, 1 through 9. Because Jeremiah also lived in a perilous time that can be equated to the times we're in right now. And listen to what the Most High told him. It says, The word of the Most High came also unto me, saying, Thou shalt not take thee a wife, neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place. For thus saith the Most High concerning the sons and concerning the daughters that are born in this place, and concerning their mothers that bear them, and concerning their fathers that begat them in this land. They shall die of grievous deaths. They shall not be lamented, neither shall they be buried, but they shall be as dung upon the face of the earth, and they shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their carcasses shall be meat for the fowls of heaven and for the beast of the earth. For thus saith the Most High, Enter not into the house of mourning, neither go to lament nor bemoan them. For I have taken away my peace from this people, saith the Most High, even loving kindness and mercies. Both the great and the small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried, neither shall men lament for them, nor cut themselves, nor make themselves bald for them. Neither shall men tear themselves for them in mourning to comfort them for the dead. Neither shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or for their mother. Thou shalt not also go into the house of feasting to sit with them to eat and drink. For thus saith the Most High, the Elohim of Israel, Behold, I will cause to cease out of this place in your eyes and in your days the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. So, that verse right there was specifically for y'all single brothers. And you know, I'm not saying this to sway you for, from one way or another. But I do find it interesting what the Most High told this righteous brother Jeremiah in the perilous times that he lived in. Because this can apply to some of us single brothers in this time right now. The Most High told him, look, Jeremiah, do not marry and do not have children in this land. Because by the time those children grow up, there's going to be tribulation in the land. So you would be birthing that child into the world in vain. You would be birthing them into a world of war and tribulation and captivity. He says that the mothers and fathers, many of them, their bodies will lie in the streets as dumb. Listen to what he's saying here. Whenever you get a chance, read Jeremiah 16, 1 through 9, and read it over and over, because I believe the same thing the Most High told Jeremiah here, he's telling a lot of brothers in these last days. Think about it, because we talked about the 144,000, you know, on Shabbat. And it talks about in Revelation 14, 4, and I don't think this is a coincidence. It said that these brothers will be brothers who are not defiled by women. So the, even the 144,000 will be brothers like Jeremiah. They will be brothers who, in the perilous times that they lived in, decided not to deal with women in no relationships or have no children and families or none of that. So instead, they were men like Paul and Jeremiah and John the Baptist men who just dedicated their whole life to teaching and preaching the kingdom because they knew they were living in perilous times and they knew a lot of the women in their generation were wicked 
and they knew if they did bear children that they were just going to be bearing those children into a world where the child will probably end up getting killed anyway because of the tribulation and the wars and the fa <clears throat> excuse me and the famines that would be going on <clears throat> so like the most high told jeremiah he said look it's best that you don't even marry or have children just focus on making it to the kingdom and i feel like that's the word of the most high to a lot of brothers in this generation he's saying look don't deal with these wicked women focus on making it to the kingdom be like the 144,000. You see what I'm saying? Be like those brothers who decided not to be defiled by women. But instead, they made their focus the kingdom and the kingdom alone. You see? And he's saying here in those verses, he said, look, don't even sit down to feast or eat and drink with a lot of these people who have their mind on worldly things. Because all they're going to do is distract you. That's what the Most High told Jeremiah. And I just wanted to uh, put that out there for the single brothers who may you know, gravitate towards that message right there. But now we're going to start dealing with some of the married couples because there's some of you who are married. So we have to preach with the righteous balance. So there's a message for y'all too. You see what I'm saying? That will strengthen y'all. But before I read that, I want to go to the apocalypse of Elijah and read something that also talks about the last days. And it kind of lines up with what we just read in Jeremiah 16 about how, you know, disastrous it's going to be and that a lot of people are going to die, you know, even the children. But listen to what it says here about what many of the women will be saying in the last days. It says, because of the stress of wars which will take place, the Antichrist will command that every boy 12 years and under be seized and be taught to shoot arrows. The midwife of the land will mourn, and she who has given birth will look to the heaven and say, Why did I sit on the birth stool to bring a child into the world? The barren woman and the virgin will rejoice and say, It is time for us to rejoice because we have no children on the earth, whether our children are in heaven. So you see, it says here that, you know, relationships will be so dysfunctional and the world will be so dysfunctional that in these last days, the women who have, uh, who birth children will be looking to the sky and say, why did I have to birth a child into this wicked world? But it says the women who are barren and virgins, it said they will be the ones rejoicing, saying, wow, I'm glad I have no children in this wicked earth, but rather my children are in heaven. Now imagine that. That's how dysfunctional relationships will be. And how dysfunctional the world will be that the women who bear children will wish that they didn't. And the women who are barren or virgins will rejoice that they have not born a child into this wicked world. So you see how dysfunctional it's going to be in these last days? Dysfunctional relationships in the last times. That's what we're going to be dealing with. So we're going to have to have the mind like Jeremiah did, like Paul did, like the Messiah did, like the 144,000, even like Judith. You see, read the book of Judith. This woman was a widow. And it said that after her widowhood, she didn't even marry again. But her focus was just on making it to the kingdom. Or even Anna the prophetess, when you read about her in the book of Luke, it said she spent all her time ministering in the temple of the Most High. And she was a virgin, uh, se she was a virgin, uh, seven, no, seven years from her virginity, something like that is said about her. But her focus was getting on in the kingdom because all these people lived in a time where there were perilous times in the earth. And they knew that there was a lot of dysfunctional relationships around them. So they made a decision not to get caught up in the dysfunctional relationships around them in the dysfunctional world that they lived in but they use wisdom to navigate through it. And that's what we're gonna have to do in these times where there's so many dysfunctional relationships in the last days. But listen to what Paul says here about the married people here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse one through 17, because I wanna read this to inspire some of you married folks in the last days, that the Most High can work in your marriage so that y'all can endure through this together. You see what I'm saying? So there's an uplifting message for the singles and for the married folks. All right. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 1. He says, now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. 
So Paul here is saying that, hey, it's a beautiful thing for a man to have his own wife and a woman to have her own husband. He says, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife does not have power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband has not power of his own body, but the wife. So do not defraud one another, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment, for I would that all men were even as myself, but every man has his proper gift of the Most High, one after this manner and another after that. So Paul was saying, look, in the grand scheme of things, in this wicked world, it's better to be unmarried so that you're not distracted by things of the flesh or dysfunctional relationships, but it's also a beautiful thing to be married. That's why Paul put that statement in there where he said, I speak by permission and not a commandment, meaning that there's no commandment that says thou shall not get married. And then there's no commandment that says thou shall get married. So the Most High gives us an option there for being single or married. And he lets us know the downfalls of both and also the um, the benefits of both. But again, Paul is saying, look, in these last evil days, I would rather you be like me, a single man or a single woman, so that all your focus can be on making it to the kingdom. So he's telling you there's nothing wrong with being single, nothing wrong with being married. But of the two, being single will actually help you have a more focused mindset for the kingdom. But listen to what he goes on to say. He says, but if they cannot contain themselves, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Meaning that, look, if you can't control your lust and you know you're somebody who can't control your lust, then you might as well get married so that at least you will be able to have that sex in righteous um, covenant. And he says next, and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Most High, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. So he's saying to those who are already married, even though we live in a world of dysfunctional relationships, you know, it's better that y'all stay married if you're already married. See what I'm saying? So if you already married, even before you came into the truth, and both of y'all are in the truth, that's a beautiful thing. Stay married. Don't you know, go back to being single just because you feel like since we live in perilous times with all these dysfunctional relationships that you want to go back to being single because that'll help you focus on the kingdom more. No, stay with the one you with if that situation is, you know, of a benefit to y'all as y'all go with each other towards the kingdom. And he says, but to the rest speak I, not the most high. If any brother have a wife that believeth not and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which have a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but the Most High has called us to peace. So that's for those of you who may have married somebody before you came into the truth. And you woke up to the truth, but the person you with has not yet. Paul is saying here that even in that situation, don't depart from that person, but through your own righteous conduct, you know, see if that person can be one to the truth and to the most high. But he says, if that person chooses to divorce you and leave, then let them depart. But you don't be the one to divorce them and leave them. Uphold your vow and your covenant of marrying them. That's for those of you who may have married somebody that was, you know, un who may have married uh, while you were an unbeliever. Now, that's not saying that those of you who are a believer now go out and marry somebody who's an unbeliever, because then that would make you unequally yoked. What he's saying here is only for those people who may have married before coming into the truth. And then after they came into the truth, the spouse may still be an unbeliever. He's only talking to those people. So don't be out here trying to marry somebody who's an unbeliever when you are already in the truth, because then you're putting yourself in a dysfunctional situation. All right. So. Paul goes on to say here, for what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But as the most high has distributed to every man, as the most high has called everyone, so let him walk. So here Paul is saying, look. 
Whatever you think that the Most High is impressing upon your heart that's expedient to you, do that. But again, at the end of the day, he's saying in these perilous times, just like the Most High told Jeremiah, in these perilous times that's coming, since there's going to be so many dysfunctional people and demonic personalities, it's best to be cautious about putting yourself in any relationship or marriage situation because of the spirits that a lot of people are going to bring. A lot of people still have soul ties from old sex partners. A lot of people still have, you know, bad teachings from dysfunctional families and, you know, abuse and things like that that have happened to them. So they bring a lot of bondage and burdens into a situation. And for some people who may not have the spirit to handle that, because focus on making it to the kingdom is already a burden in itself. So the Most High is telling some of us, just like he told Jeremiah, look, why put extra burden on yourself? You got to fight sin, hell, the flesh, death, and the devil to make it to the kingdom. Why throw another five bricks in your backpack of having to deal with somebody with all these dysfunctional emotions and bipolar and one day they up an emotional roller coaster. Look, you don't need all that drama when you already got enough on your plate trying to make it to the kingdom. So, you know, for some of us, what the Most High told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 16 may really be an on time word where he's saying, as hey, you, the, 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 the last thing you need to be focusing on is getting some wife or some husband. You need to be focused on making it to the kingdom. You don't need to bring no more dysfunctionality into your relationships because what you're dealing with now is already a mess, you see? And besides that, even if some of us were to start a family with how close we are to the collapse and many things taking place, you know, it, it may be vain to even do that. Because like we just read in 2nd Ezra, it said, let those who marry, marry as though they would be widowed. Let those who buy do it as though they would not keep what they buy. Meaning the perilous times we're going to enter into is going to be a time where not many things are going to be long lasting. A lot of things are going to be come and go. Cop and blow, come and go, go and come. So it's not good to embrace or get attached to any of these things or these people because the times that we live in is a very inconsistent and tumultuous time to where people are going to come and go. Things are going to be changing so rapidly. People are going to be running to and fro. A lot of people are going to be confused. They're not going to stay in your life. One minute they'll love you, the next they'll hate you. So there's going to be so many dysfunctional relationships. We need to be wise about what relationships or fellowships that we put ourselves in. We got to guard our heart. But even through all that, even though we live in these perilous times with all these demonic personalities, dysfunctional people, dysfunctional relationships, we still need to understand that we cannot forsake the fellowship of the brethren. As messed up and jacked up as all of us are, we still need each other. But we just need to learn how to coexist and be amongst each other without tearing apart each other. We must learn how to deal with the snakes, the devils, and the betrayers without you know, it causing collateral damage on innocent, pure hearted people. We have to learn how to kill the wolves and not for the sheep to get scarred up in the midst of it. You see what I'm saying? We really have to learn how to walk that balance because we do need each other. But we also we also need to learn how to guard ourselves from dysfunctional relationships in the last time. And I'm going to end with this scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 8 through 12 it says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor for if they fall the one will lift up his fellow but woe to him that is alone when he falls for he does not have another to help him up again if two lie down together then they have heat but how can one be warm alone and if one prevail against him two shall withstand him and a threefold cord is not easily broken so you see whenever we get onto the wilderness we can't make it alone. We're going to need other brothers and sisters so that we can have functional relationships amongst each other so that we can endure until the end together. But even with that and having that love, we must understand that there will be false brethren. There will be dysfunctional people. There will be betrayers and people with murderous hearts like Cain had. And they will be amongst us as well. So we're going to have to learn how to deal with the functional people and the dysfunctional people at the same damn time. And to do it, 
in spirit and in truth, and to do it in a spirit of overcoming, prevailing triumph and victory. You see? So it's a delicate balance, but we're going to have to learn how to do it. So I hope this helps somebody as we've been talking about relationships in the last days and what we can expect from people. And I begin to touch a little bit on how we navigate through this, but I'm going to touch more on that in part two when we talk about love, discernment, and carrying a mighty sword. Before I go, I just want to uh, once again let brothers and sisters know about some of the works of the ministry that we put forth that have been a blessing to brothers and sisters. A great project that we released just last week is a brand new audio book called The Book of Prayers. This is a audio book that is narrated by myself. It has 44 chapters of the prayers of the matriarchs and the patriarchs, the prayers of our righteous ancestors. I went through all of the scriptures, the 66 books of the Bible, uh, the Apocrypha, the lost books like Jasher, Jubilees, Enoch, and I found the places everywhere where our people were praying to the Most High. So this audio book, the Book of Prayers, is an audio book that contains all the prayers of our righteous ancestors, all the way from the prayers of Abraham to the prayers of the Messiah, to the prayers of King David in the Psalms, to the prayers of Adam and Eve from the first and second book of Adam and Eve, to the prayers of Esdras and Baruch and Judith and Hannah and Miriam and Esther, all the prayers of the righteous patriarchs and matriarchs in one audio book. And it's narrated by myself. It's also narrated from the King James Version. We don't use any of the pagan names. We put together this audio book because the scripture says we must pray without ceasing. The scripture also tells us that by connecting with the Most High in prayer, that is our strength. And there's a lot of brothers and sisters that they don't know how to pray. Uh, for whatever reason, prayer is boring to them. So this is an audio book and this is a tool that will help you in your prayer life. For those times that you want to get in the presence of the Most High, but you don't know what to say, just listen to the prayers of your righteous ancestors. Listen to how they prayed with such sincerity and purity of heart. And just listening to their prayers will touch your heart to pray to the Most High for yourself. And whenever you listen to the prayers of your righteous ancestors, you start to see uh, patterns in how they prayed, how they approached the Most High. And it will teach you how to pray as well just by listening to their prayers. Once again, that's the Book of Prayers audio book narrated by myself. For brothers and sisters who are interested in downloading that audio book and investing in that, I will put the link in the description box underneath this video so that you can invest in that great project that's already been a blessing to so many brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Another project we've done is the 613 Laws of Torah audio book. This is a five hour long audio book also narrated by myself. It's also narrated from the King James Version. We don't use any of the pagan names. In the audio book is only the laws and commands, all 613 of them. In the audio book, I also give you the chapter and verse where each law is found so you can follow along on your own. We put together this audio book because we are commanded in Joshua chapter one, verse seven and eight to meditate on the laws and commands of the most high every day and night and to obey them. And by doing so, we will prosper and have good success. So we put together an audio book so brothers and sisters can download this and you can listen to the laws and commands while you're on the go. Because we live at a time where people are constantly on the move. You can download this audio book to your desktop, your laptop, your device, your phone. You can listen to the laws and commands in your Bluetooth headphone, in your aux cord while you're driving to work, while you're at work, while you're in the kitchen cooking, working out. You can be listening to the laws and commands in the background. Because scripture says that faith comes by hearing. So by hearing and listening to the laws and commands, it causes you to internalize it even more and causes those laws to be written on your heart. It's the 613 Laws of Torah audio book. Uh, for those interested in investing in that project and downloading that, I will put a link in the description box underneath this video to where you can invest in that and download that 613 Laws of Torah audio book. And we have some other projects we've done, like the Words of the Messiah audiobook. That is also another audiobook narrated by myself that contains all the words of the Messiah, all of his parables. It's an audiobook with only the words of the Messiah. 
for those interested in investing in that. I'll put the link in the description box for that. We also have the Words of the Father audiobook. That's a 14 hour long audiobook, also narrated by myself. It contains all the words of the Most High out of his own mouth, recorded in scripture, all the way from Genesis, where he said, Let there be light, all the way to the New Testament, when he looked at the Messiah and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The scripture says, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. So the words of the father audio book is an audio book with only the words of the father out of his own mouth and through the inspiration of the prophets. I'll put a link in the description box underneath this video for all the brothers and sisters who want to download and invest in those projects. Another project that we've launched is the Hebrews for Excellence in Exodus campaign. We launched this campaign in January of this year. And through this campaign, we are striving to fulfill what is written in scripture, where it says that this truth will be preached to all four corners of the earth. So with the Hebrews for Excellence in Exodus campaign, we are traveling from city to city all over the United States and all over the world to preach, to teach, to baptize, to visit the orphanages, the homeless shelters, the prisons, the jails, the hospitals, the nursing homes to minister to our people. Since launching this movement in January of this year, we've already been as far west as San Diego, California, to as far east as Jamestown, Virginia. And whenever we go to these places, we have been doing baptisms and preaching and teaching. We've also been having business meetings with brothers and sisters to discuss homeschooling, home fellowship, home businesses. These are three things that will cause our people to truly be set apart and self-sustained in these last and wicked times. So the Hebrews for Excellence in Exodus campaign has been doing a lot of traveling and a lot of work. So for brothers and sisters interested in joining us with boots on the ground with the Hebrews for Excellence in Exodus campaign, reach out to me. I'll put my email in the description box underneath this video. Reach out to me if you want to join us in these ministry travels on doing some work. For brothers and sisters interested in donating funds to the Hebrews for Excellence in Exodus campaign, I will put a link in the description box underneath this video to show you how you can donate to this cause. I'm really looking forward to work that we'll be doing. We're going to be going to New York City next month. I will be announcing the dates for that very soon to the brothers and sisters who want to be baptized in New York City next month and who want to meet up to have business meetings with us. We're going to be in New York City next month. So, um, I'm definitely looking forward to what is to come and um, most high will will be back tomorrow to go through some more scriptures. But until then, family, let's endure to the end with victory, success and destiny. Shalom.